heaven, though, uh, through faith. I've seen it through a glass darkly. The Spirit of God has revealed it to me. Amen. I've read about what the Spirit of God inspired the men of God to pin down about that glorious city. Especially over in Revelation uh, chapter uh, 20 through 22. Hebrews chapter 11 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things, what? Not seen. I've not seen heaven with these eyes, but I have seen it by faith as I've read the scriptures and been told about how wonderful that celestial city is that is the home of the saints of God. Amen. And by the way, I'm in heaven right now. You say, preacher, you say earth is heaven? No. I, Christ Jesus is in me uh, through faith, and I am in Christ Jesus, seated in the heavenlies with him this very moment. Amen. You want some Bible for that? All right. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says, And he hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm in heaven right now. Amen. Now, you can see heaven too the same way as I've seen it. You can see it by faith. You can read about this spectacular place in the pages of the Word of God that were inspired by the Spirit of God. But it is a very exclusive sight. You must be a Christian to be able to see it. And one of these days, you'll not see it with your own eyes unless you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved. If you're not saved, you'll never see heaven. Right. Worse than that, you can't enter into it. Now, if you're unsaved, you're in darkness. Spiritual darkness. The God of this world hath blinded the eyes of them that believe not. And being in darkness, you cannot see that land of light. This is not your land if you're not saved. See, Christians, we are pilgrims and strangers here. We seek the city which is to come. Our home is heaven, although we're pilgrims and strangers here. But if you're lost, if you've never been saved, this is your home. And I tell you, you'll suffer the same fate as this home. Because the Bible says that one of these days, the elements of this world, of the, the earth will uh, melt with a fervent heat. Right. Heaven's a real place, too, by the way. It's just as real as this pulpit is before me. Heaven is a real place. Just as real as Turner Street Baptist Church is that city up in the heavenlies, folks. I like what John R. Rice said about heaven one day. He wrote a book about heaven, and he sent it off to the publishers, and it came back with some corrections. I feel sorry for the people they had to make corrections to anything I wrote. But they sent it back. John R. Rice is a very smart man, and there was one correction there, and he didn't sit too well with him. See, John R. Rice had capitalized heaven in that book. And the publishers had changed it back uh, to a lowercase h. So he sent word back to the publishers. I was taught in school uh, that, that places and things uh, that have a name are capitalized. And heaven is a real place. And you should capitalize that h. And they capitalized it. Amen. It's a real place, folks. And you should know that it's your home. Amen. I remember a, a preacher, I believe it was Truett, down in Texas. He knocked on the door of a man's house, and the man opened the door. And they were speaking for a while, and the man was very well-to-do, and he said, uh, I'll have you know that I own a hundred acres to the west. That didn't impress Brother Trudeau. But the man spoke, he continued speaking, he said, I own a hundred acres to the south. He said, I own a hundred acres that way, and I own fifty acres that way. And George Truett looked him eye to eye and said, well, how much do you own up there? That's what's going to matter. The things of this earth are going to pass away. You can take the deeds to all the land and all the world and put them in one great big pile, but they'll not be worth a one, they will not be worth that home in heaven that we'll have one day. Amen. It's a real place. Now I've seen some wondrous things in this world, haven't you? Amen. I mean, I went, I've seen the ocean, and there's nothing like sitting out on the balcony. And looking out across the sand, out in the ocean, in a storm brewing. You ever sit out there like that? Beautiful sight. There's nothing like a sunset or a, a sunrise on the ocean. But I tell you, that pales in significance to the beauty and splendor of heaven. Amen. I've seen uh, uh, mountain landscapes. I love the mountains, folks. I can't think of a better place to live than here in East Tennessee. Amen. We have Amen. wonderful mountains. 
about the mountains pale in insignificance when compared to the glories and splendors of the holy Mount of Zion. I'm talking about heaven. Amen. Amen. I've climbed up to the top of Cleanman's Dome while it was raining below and been above the clouds before. What right. a beautiful sight. Amen. But that home above the clouds, heaven, is more spectacular than that. Amen. I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but I've seen pictures. It looks spectacular. Nothing compared to the home of the saints of God, which is heaven. Amen. I can't imagine how beautiful earth was before when God first made it, when he said it was good. Right. Man brought a curse upon this land. Amen. It's not what it used to be. Right. But it still cannot compare of the splendor of that glorious home of the soul for the saints of God. Amen. Let's talk about this a little bit further. Now, now men have made some great things. Men have made some great architecture. Uh, they've sculpted uh, things from nature beautifully. I think about the Taj Mahal. Uh, what a spectacular uh, piece of uh, architecture that is. Amen. But I tell you what, I've got a home up into the heavens and make that thing look like a shack. Amen. 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 The Sistine Chapel with all the paintings up on of the ceiling of it is nothing to be compared with the glory and splendor of the one who painted the heavens uh, during uh, uh, every Amen. single sunset. Right. Amen. The Hanging Gardens, one of the, the seven wonders of the world, is nothing to be compared with what God hath made up in the heavens. See, Jesus said in John 14, he said, if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And he says, yes, he's going Lord. to prepare a place for us. Amen. Now I'm going to preach to you about four things that, that we're going to see up in heaven. And that's the title of some of the things in heaven. Now, before we talk about the things that are in heaven, let's talk about some things that aren't there. Now, some things you won't see in heaven are these. You'll not see any starving children up in heaven. Amen. I know it might break your heart when you see a commercial and it shows <coughs> those third world nations where the little children's bellies are swollen, not from eating too much, but because they're starving today. Amen. You'll not see that up in heaven. Amen. No starvation. The one who calls the manna to fall down from the heavens and feed the Israelites in the wilderness will feed us up there. He'll feed his flock. There'll be no more pain. Do you have an ache or pain in your body? Maybe you've learned to live with pain. But up there, pain will be a former thing that has passed away. There'll be no more pain up in heaven. There'll be no crisis centers up in heaven where, where battered children or battered wives have to go in their times of crisis. There'll be none of that up in heaven. Amen. Amen. There'll be no sin up in heaven. You know, sin is our big problem, folks. That's why things that are gone awry in this world, because man brought sin into the world. Sin brought death. Sin brought nothing but destruction. But up there, sin will be a thing of the past, too. There'll be no more cancer. Say amen. If anybody know a loved one who's been taken from this world uh, through cancer, well, cancer will be no more up in heaven. Right. Say amen. amen. There'll be no nursing. Now, I remember preaching at a nursing home when I was a young preacher. And I, as I was preaching, I looked out and every single resident that I was preaching to was sitting in a wheelchair. And as I was preaching, all of a sudden I started, I got on heaven. I started talking about heaven. And I said, up in heaven there'll be no more wheelchairs. Amen. And all of a sudden, that little old bony hand started coming up in the air. <laughs> huh? A few eyes started being locked away. The wheelchair will be gone up in heaven. Amen. I recall a, 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 a tombstone that I saw one time. I think I've shared this with you before. But it was a picture on Facebook of a tombstone, a real tombstone in a cemetery. And that tombstone was the most unique tombstone I'd ever seen. It was a shape like a wheelchair. And on the very armrest of that wheelchair, there was a little boy like this. That spoke volumes to me. That told me that there was a little boy that was crippled here on earth. Right. But he knew Jesus as his Savior, and as he went up to heaven, the wheelchair was left behind. <laughs> Thus it is in heaven, folks. No wheelchairs, no more sin, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain. That is the home of the soul, folks. Amen. No more injustice. It seems that justice has fallen in the streets nowadays. Right. But no more injustice. Right. No more cemeteries. 
Praise the Lord for that. Amen. I remember as a kid, we'd drive by a big cemetery, and I'd think, man, if the world just continues going, one of these days, the whole earth will be a cemetery. <laughs> you think that when you were a kid? Maybe you did. Maybe I'm just a weirdo. But anyways, no cemeteries up there. No funeral homes. <laughs> no more trials. No more tribulations. No more deformity. I know handicapped uh, people are, are blessed. But I tell you, one of these days, going to lay that aside. Amen. 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 Won't that be a spectacular time up in heaven? As all yeah. the former things are done away with. Eternity is better for the saint of God. Right. I remember that miracle I preached on a few weeks ago. Of Jesus transforming the water into wine. And as that wine that Jesus had made was brought to the governor of the feast, he said, whoa, he said, most people uh, put the good wine first, but you saved the best wine uh, for the last. And isn't that what Jesus does for the saint of God? Uh, we get uh, pretty good stuff now. I mean, we're blessed now. Amen. We have peace now. We have hope now. But one of these days, the best is yet to come. Say amen. Amen. If that don't excite you, there's something wrong. If that does not ignite a fire in your soul, your wood is wet. You need to get back down to business with God. Amen. Right. Eternity's better for the saint of God. Now, I think about what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.21. He says, to die is gain. Now, why can the Apostle Paul say to die is gain? Well, I personally believe he's the one who was called up to the third heaven. <laughs> And saw things unlawfully to be uttered. He saw it. And I tell you, when he come back down here, everything pale in significance. And I tell you what it does. Now, we're talking about all the things that aren't in heaven. And all those things excited me. But all of a sudden it occurred to me, there's one thing that we won't see in heaven that will make us very sad. We won't see, see the unsaved there. Right. Right. We won't see those who didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. I tell you, that fact ought to be made real to every single one of you Christians. So real uh, that you will stop at nothing to see your loved ones saved. And so that you'll stop at nothing to bear witness to the Lord Jesus Christ throughout all this world, folks. Amen. I often preach a funeral and I'll say to your loved one, if they knew the Savior, they have everything they ever desired except for one thing, they want to see you there one day. Yeah. Right. You better make sure your loved ones are saved. Right. Now that's the things that aren't there. Let's talk about a few things that are there. Now the Bible doesn't give us a whole lot about heaven. It does tell us quite a bit about New Jerusalem. And that's basically what I'm going to be speaking about. I believe that's the city that God prepared for us. And you can read about that in the last few chapters of Revelation. But one of the things that sticks out to me is that the Bible says it has a street of gold in it. Does that prick up your ears a little bit? A street of gold. I'm going to walk on a street of gold one day. I don't have any gold bars put up in my house. Brother Huford might, but I don't. <laughs> but the street's going to be made of that stuff. Now, People put a lot of value in gold, don't they? You ever have been in the river and thought, man, if I could just rub my foot across a piece of gold, to find a piece of gold, everything would be so much better, and I could, I would never have to worry ever again if I could just find right. a gigantic hunk of gold. Amen. I don't know about you, but I've been tubing and thought that myself. Man, I wish I could run across a vein of gold. <laughs> I never did find nothing. <laughs> but one of these days, I'm just going to walk all over. I was hoping my foot would rub against a, a chunk of gold. But one of these days, my finger is going to tread upon a street of gold. Amen. I remember I was a student of history as a young man. I was going to be a history teacher when I first started out for my calling to preach. So I took two years in college uh, towards being a history teacher. And I remember very vividly when they talked about the gold rush. People sold everything they had and they moved out west. They're going to find gold. They're going to strike it rich. And some of them did find gold. Very few of them. But many of them met their demise on that long trip. Right. Many people spent their whole life looking at what, what would only be pavement up in heaven. And by the way, the gold we have down here is inferior to heaven's gold. Right. The Bible says that that gold up in heaven is so pure, it's like transparent glass. Amen. Amen. 
Pure gold. Shines like a glass. Revelation 21, 21. Nothing here on earth can compare to what's in heaven. Right. Now let me illustrate that. Uh, somebody was just talking about flying on a plane with me before church. I believe it's Brother Wayne. He said he'd like to fly on a plane one of these days. I happen to get to fly on a plane once. But as you uh, embark on your plane, you start out there on the runway, and the, the plane starts ascending. And as you start ascending in that plane, if you've got a window seat, you can look out. And something you'll notice as that plane ascends, what happens to the things on earth? They get smaller. Uh, I mean, you'll see cities that are gigantic if you're down on Earth's perspective and looking at them upward. But as you're in the plane looking down upon these cities, they look very small. Right. And that's the way it is. The closer you get to heaven, folks, the smaller the things of this world become. Amen. When you start thinking about that glorious home of heaven, and the things of this earth become smaller and more and more insignificant. The things of this world will pass away. The things of this world are not permanent, but those things up in glory are forever. Amen. We spend all of our lives here on earth accumulating things uh, that will dissolve. Amen. But when treasures are laid up in heaven, they do not dissolve. They are forever. I remember uh, uh, shortly after Brother Sam Slider's death, or it was while well, I was preparing for, his, uh, for the sermon there for his funeral, uh, the Lord recalled to my mind that verse where he says, Lay up your treasures in heaven, where thieves don't break in and steal, and where the rust doesn't corrupt it, or the, or the, or the moss can't get to it. But anyways, I started thinking about that verse in a new way. Our greatest treasures here on earth are not our gold or our automobiles or our houses. It's the people we love. Amen. And we should strive to see all of those treasures laid up in heaven one of these days. Amen. We should strive to see them one day in that city until it's worth your while. But hey, let's talk about the streets of gold a little bit longer. I mean, it's not only a street of gold. There's gates of pearl, walls of jasper. And even the foundations of the city, the Bible says, are made of ball man or precious stone. Amen. Now, I grew up around construction sites. And I never knew a contractor who spent a lot of time trying to make their foundations look pretty. Just concrete. Put some rebar in there. Make it strong. Nobody cares about what it looks like. God was so careful when he made the city, he even made the foundations beautiful. Amen. With all manner of precious stone. It reminds me of a story I, I heard many years ago about a, a man named William Dyke. But when William Dyke was 10 years old, he was blinded by a serious accident. And despite this disability, he graduated from his university with honors. And while he was in school, William fell in love with the daughter of a high-ranking uh, British naval officer. This naval officer offered to pay for surgery to try to fix William Dyke's eyes. Shortly before the wedding, William had cutting-edge surgery that day. Uh, he had eye surgery in hopes that the operation would restore the sight that he lost when he was 10 years old. But he told the surgeon, he said, when we get done, I don't want you to unwrap my eyes. He said, I want you to wait until my wedding day. Amen. Because I want the first thing that I see to be my wife that I fell in love with. Amen. So as he was standing there uh, beside the preacher, the wedding march began. And while the bride was being walked down by her daddy, they started unwinding the, the racks on his eyes. And the first thing he saw was his lovely bride. And he said out loud, he said, you're more beautiful than I ever expected you to be. Amen. And I believe that's what's going to happen to us, folks. I mean, I feel like the older I get, the more the bandages are unwrapped. Amen. The older you get, the closer you get to heaven. And you may be able to kind of see through there kind of faintly. But when we get to heaven, that last bandage will be taken off and we'll say this is the most beautiful place. It's been more beautiful than I ever could imagine. Yeah, Amen. This describes New Jerusalem as being a wife adorned for her husband. It's going to be the most beautiful thing, folks. Amen. The only thing I can imagine be more beautiful is the land, which is the light of that city. But the city itself is going to be spectacular. We'll see walls of jasper, gates of pearl, foundations of all manner of precious stones. 
Will the public feel like the Queen of Sheba when she came into Jerusalem? She had heard all the merchantmen talk about how beautiful Jerusalem was under Solomon's reign. How spectacular it was. But when she came and visited for herself, she said, The half had not been told me of thy splendor. And that's going to be the way it is, Christian. You know that city is 1,500 square miles? I mean, I was trying to imagine how big this city is. And I'd seen pictures of how people had figured it out. I mean, one person said it would go from Maine to the tip of Florida all the way over to the Rocky Mountains. If you were to set it up on top of the United States, that's big. And it's that tall. That's our home. And it comes down to earth one day. Amen. Now I don't know whether it sits on the breath of the earth, hovers above the earth, sits on the earth. But I don't care uh, what it does as long as it's here. And it's going to be my city, folks. Amen. It'll be your city too if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Amen. So there's the streets of gold. But also up in heaven there's going to be the saints of old. Amen. Amen. Now, your heroes should not be sports stars. Right. I tell you what, the, the less I know about the sports the stars or athletes, the better. And if I like a TV show, I definitely don't want to look too much into the, the actors playing the parts. I can guarantee you nothing but disappointment would come. Amen. Your heroes should not be people of that sort. Your heroes should be the heroes of the faith. Amen. That's who we should seek to be like. That's who we should point our children to. Amen. I mean, think, of, uh, think about this. You're going to get to meet some of those folks. I mean, you might be excited if you go to a ball game. Maybe you may get to meet uh, some uh, athlete or some superstar. But I tell you, you're going to get to meet the saints of God up in heaven. Amen. Think about it. I want to talk to Moses one of these days. Yeah. Hey, Moses. How you doing? <laughs> huh? What was it like when you stood before Pharaoh? And then Moses is going to be able to tell me what it was like to stand before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And I'm going to say, Moses, how was it you got so mad at those people and hit that rock when you're supposed to speak to it? And we'll just be able to talk like old friends. I look forward to talking to David. David, what was it like there when you stood before that giant and you took up those five smooth stones out of that brook? Why'd you get five of them, by the way? You only needed one. Huh? Caleb, not you. <laughs> Caleb, what was it like fighting up that mountainside, uh, taking that mountain that the Lord promised to you? Can you imagine the conversations you're going to get to have with those heroes of the faith? The ones you heard about in Sunday school as a child? The ones you've heard preached about from this pulpit? I mean, you can pick your own favorites. Amen. I've got my own. And I tell you, one guy I'm really looking forward to meeting. I have and this will shock you. But that man who is filled with a thousand demons, that maniac of Gadara, I can't wait to sit down and talk to that guy. And I can imagine up in heaven him just wiping those tears left and right as he's telling about how the Lord delivered him from those demons. When everybody else had given up on him and tried chaining him up, how Jesus set him free. Amen. It's going to be an exciting time. Amen. You say, well, we know all of them? Yeah, I think we'll know every one of them. You know, I think about this. I, I think about Mount, Mount Transfiguration. Here Peter, James, and John are standing on Mount Transfiguration and Jesus is transformed before them. And there were two other men there. It was Moses and Elijah. Amen. Jesus did not say, Peter, let me introduce you. This is Moses and this is Elijah. Peter knew who they were. Amen. He foolishly said, let's build a tabernacle, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. But he knew who they were. Amen. I know we're going to know them. But even sweeter than meeting Moses, David, Elijah, all those old heroes of the faith, we're going to get to see some of them people that were in Christ that we knew personally here. I mean, we've all passed by a coffin at some time, haven't we, of somebody we love. If they knew Christ, you'll see them again up in heaven. They'll be there. They are there right now. They're absent from the body and present with the Lord. Amen. I think about some of the church members here that have gone for. I think about Sister Sister Floyd up there in heaven waiting. Florence, Sam, Velma, Edith, Irene, Anoni. 
I, I'm not trying to leave anybody out, but they're all up there. <coughs> Absent from this congregation, but present with the Lord in that one. Amen. I think about Papa. That's his Bible up here. Is it still there? There it is. Amen. Up in heaven. My Aunt Pat. Y'all love my Aunt Pat, didn't you? Up in heaven. It's going to be a great reunion one of these days, folks. Yeah. We'll get to see those people that's gone on before. Do you have somebody over there? Say amen if you do. Amen. A son, a daughter, a mom, a dad, a spouse, a dear friend. One of these days, our cheeks will touch again when we give them a great big hug up in glory. If they knew Christ and you knew Christ, you will be reunited one of these days in the greatest reunion that has ever taken place. Amen. Y'all know about the reunions we have down here. We have a reunion. Not everybody shows up. Some people show up and you say, man, we ought to get together more. And I'd love to see you besides in a reunion. One of these days it will be a permanent reunion for all those that know Christ. Amen. Our arms will embrace them once again. One of my favorite stories to tell the funeral is this. A man was sitting by his beloved spouse and, and they were in the hospital. And he looked down to his dear wife and he was watching to see if her chest was still moving, uh, taking each and every breath. But soon he didn't see any movement. He spoke very quietly and he said, uh, Dear wife, are you still in the land of the living? And she spoke up faintly and said, No, I'm still in the land of the dying. I'm going to the land of the living. Right. Amen. It's the land of the living. A place where there's no more death. Many of our loved ones have left this world in weakness. Many of our loved ones have left this world with a fevered brow or through pain. But now uh, all that's given away to eternal health and strength. Yes. I still have my mom and dad. I still have my wife and my kids. But one day uh, the cruel hand of death may come and take one of them from me. From my presence here. But I need not worry because I know I'll see them again. Because I know they all have a testimony of knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. Right. Well perhaps I'll be gone first. And I'll be up there waiting for them to rejoin. Amen. That's what heaven is folks. That's right. And when we're up there in heaven, we're going to stroll across heaven with each other one day. Y'all like that song? Amen. I want to stroll over heaven with you some sweet day when all the trials and sorrows are vanished away. I struggle to remember the words, but I can't wait. Mothers and sons, fathers and daughters, husbands and wives will have a great reunion day one of these days. If they were saved, as sure as I'm standing here, they'll be there. You say, preacher, will we know each other? I hear that question sometimes. You ever had anybody ask you that question? Will we know each other up in heaven? Right. Yeah. I don't believe we'll really truly know each other till we get to heaven. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, we will know as we are known. I believe what that means is we'll really know with the mind of God one another. That's right. Amen. Looking forward to that day. Now let's move on. We're going to see streets of gold, saints of old, and then the souls we've told. You see, the souls we told up in heaven. Now, there's three wondrous things in heaven I'm going to put under that, under that, that point. We're going, to have, we're going to expect some to be there that's not there. Now, that's going to be very sad. Yeah. There's going to be some there we didn't expect to be there. Right. It'll be a pleasant surprise. Yeah. But the greatest surprise of all is that I'm there. Because I, I, I mean, within my own flesh, I've not done anything to earn my way into heaven. I'm not good enough. Right. I've sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't know why God extended his mercy toward me, but he did. <laughs> but let's break those down for a minute. First of all, them that's not there. People we assumed were saved. You know, we check on things a lot of times just to make sure they're safe. If your kid goes away, you're always wondering if they're safe, aren't you? Are they getting anything? Are they going to be all right? You might even call and check on them. You might say to your kid before they, they take a trip somewhere, say, call me when you get there. You want that peace of mind to know it's all right. But how much more important is it to know that your child knows Christ as their Savior? Right. I mean, they can leave this world, folks. Don't just assume somebody's saved. Because they were raised in church, don't just assume that they're all right. Maybe yeah, because they sing in church or, or they participate in some activity in church. Don't assume that, that they're saved because of that. Right. They have to come to Jesus themselves. Right. Yeah. There's going to be many people uh, who assume that, that they were saved themselves and didn't even know. If Jesus spoke at that time. He says, many will say to me in that day, the day of the great white throne judgment. 
Uh, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will we profess them, sorry I never knew you. Amen. Depart from me. You just can't assume people are saved. Are your daughters going to be there? Your son, is your son going to be there? Lay up your treasure in heaven. Make sure that they're there. Then there's going to be people we didn't expect to be there. Will be there. That'll be a pleasant surprise. I mean, I couldn't imagine the thief who was on the cross beside of Jesus, his family, seeing him up in heaven. I, they'd probably give up on him. I mean, after all, he must have done some very serious things to be crucified. Right. I mean, that wasn't a light punishment. But here he is hanging upon uh, the, the, the cross. And at first, both thieves railed against Jesus. But one thief saw something different in Jesus. And he said, remember me when you enter into heaven. And you know what Jesus did? He remembered it. Amen. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Amen. One day, one day that them parents, if they were believers, showed up there in paradise, or up in heaven, I mean. And they said, there's my son. <coughs> I think about, when I think about this, I think about Curtis Hudson. <coughs> Curtis Hudson told a story one time about how he went to a TV repair shop. And while he was in the TV repair shop, he was witnessing to the man who was running the place. He gave him a track, and, and he, he went through the plan of salvation with this man at the TV repair shop. But the, team, the guy at the TV repair shop didn't trust the Lord. So he left, and then the next day he was at church. And when he extended the invitation, a man walked down the aisle. And he walked down and talked to the man. He said, uh, do you, have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? He said, I did yesterday. He said, well, praise the Lord. Can you tell me about it? He said, well, you're the one that taught me how to be saved. <laughs> Kurt said, said, what? I've never seen you before in my life. The guy said, well, you told me how to be saved. Kurt said, said you're, not, you're mistaken. He said, no, I was at a TV repair shop and I was over in the aisle and I heard you talking to the guy up at the counter and you told him how to be saved and there I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save me and he saved me that day. Amen. Amen. So I didn't know that guy existed. Amen. But he got to, he got to meet him in heaven already if that guy's died. No curse us in there. You never know what you've done for the Lord. How it'll prosper. I mean, get out there and do it. Do the work. Give the tracks out. I know people have been saved by picking up a track and reading it. Yeah. You never know uh, what is happening. Just keep on sowing the seed of the Word of God. Keep telling people how to be saved. You'll see your spiritual, you'll see the spiritual fruit of your labor one of these days up in heaven. You'll get to stand by those converts that you led to the Lord Jesus Christ, those Sunday school kids uh, that you taught. Uh, those uh, that you gave tracts to, and they'll sing that song, maybe, thank you for giving to the Lord. Amen. And then once again, the, the most astounding things, I'm going to be there. I'm looking forward to being there. I'm unworthy. I'm not going to be in heaven because I'm a preacher. Right. I'm not going to be in heaven because I've memorized a bunch of Bible quotes. I'm not going to be in heaven because my mom and daddy was Christian. I'm going to be in heaven because of the grace of God. He extended it toward me when I believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, believing He died on the cross for my sins, and that He arose again from the dead. When I called upon Him and professed Him, He saved me and wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that's why I'm going to be there. The question is, will you be there? Amen. Will your loved ones be there? Now let's get to the last point, and I'm going to wrap it up with this one. We're going to see streets of gold along with other splendors. We're going to see the saints of old. All them. Heroes of the faith. Then we'll see the souls we told. I hope you have some that you've told. Amen. Then we're going to see the shepherd of the fold. Amen. Amen. All these things I spoke about already are very glorious. Amen. But the first person I want to see when I get to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm looking forward to talking to Moses, that madman at uh, Gadara after he transformed. I, I'm, I'm going to know his name one of these days. But I want to see Jesus first. Yeah. The shepherd of the fold. Now, Mays Jackson used to tell a story, and every once in a while I share it. It's been a while, so I'm going to share it again. But Mays Jackson, y'all know who Mays Jackson is? Up in heaven now. He preached a truck driver special. A big man. He preached so hard, when he got done preaching, he put an overcoat on immediately because he'd be all sweaty. 
But I love the story he used to tell about rubber gloves. He said, and I hope I can retell it. I've not practiced it in a long time. <laughs> Y'all bear with me. There was this little girl who had a mama, and her mama was a lot different than the other mamas at school. Her mama always wore rubber gloves. I mean, she went to school, and they'd have a school events, and she'd see all the other mothers, and none of them had rubber gloves on like her mama always wore. So one day, curiosity started getting to her, and she said, Mama, why do you wear rubber gloves? None of the other mamas wear rubber gloves. And the mama looked down and said, Honey, when you're older, I'll tell you the story, but right now you're a little young. But the little girl insisted. She even began to cry. And the mother finally brushed the tears away from the eyes of her, her young daughter there and says, Okay. So she reached down and, and with her teeth she pulled the rubber glove off of her hand. And her hand was all marred and scarred. And you know how uh, somebody who's been burned with fire has uh, had their skins all twisted. And she pulled off her other glove and both hands were all twisted and marred. And she said, honey, when you're just a baby, a lamp turned over in your bedroom, caught your blankets on fire. He said, I ran over there as fast as I could and I grabbed those uh, fiery uh, uh, blankets in my hands and I, I ran and I took them as far as I could away from you and I threw them out in the yard. And in doing so, it burnt my hands and scarred them. And the little girl said, Mama, can I kiss those hands that it took the fire away? Amen. Mama, can I kiss the hands of the one who saved me? And she kissed her mama's hands and the tears flowed. Now I'm going to heaven one of these days. Amen? Amen. And one of these days when I get to heaven, I'm going to kiss the hands of the one who saved me from the fire. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, his hands are scarred, not marred with flames, but they're scarred by the nails that were driven into him that day when he hung between the heavens and the earth, paying for my sin. When the judgment fires of God fell upon him figuratively, he saved my wretched soul. I'm going to kiss those hands one of these days. Amen. The shepherd of the fold. It's going to be come to pass what it says over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. The Bible says that that city we spoke of earlier, the Lamb is the light. Who's the Lamb? The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, is that Lamb. It's the light. Is He your Savior? As we close, have you made your reservation for this city? You get RSVP. You say, how do I do that? You do so by faith. If you'll ask the Lord to save you, He will today. If you want to be a citizen of New Jerusalem, you can become a citizen today by having Jesus write your name in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life. But you're going to have to come to Him. Ask Him to save you. Amen. Do you believe He died on the cross for your sin? Amen. Do you believe He rose from the dead? Amen. You already got, got most of that way. Just ask Him to save you and He will. Today's the day to examine yourself as we pray.